like to welcome everyone and introduce myself. My name is Dr. Joanne Fox and I serve as the principal of UBC Vantage College. And it's my real pleasure to host today's session, which is part of our academic speaker series at Vantage. So the Vantage One programs involve uh, a mandatory summer term. And this past summer, we had over 400 international students enrolled across the three Vantage One programs in arts, engineering, and science, with about half those students located here in Canada and half located at various locations around the world. And so I'm really excited about this opportunity to hear from several uh, Vantage faculty uh, about their experiences and the lessons learned uh, from teaching online during this past summer term. I think there will be lots of relevant insights as we prepare, prepare for teaching online this fall. So the format for today's session is uh, that we will have, so next slide please Brian, we will have a 45 minute presentation block uh, with 15 minutes for each speaker, followed by a 45 minute question and answer period. The presentation section of this event uh, will be recorded so that we can post for those participants who were uh, not able to join us today. We will not record the question and answer period. And this is uh, so as to encourage dialogue and provide for the opportunity to keep our conversations as open as possible. I would like to um, introduce two moderators who are helping us today. Um, Dr. Sandra Zappa Holman is an assistant professor in the Department of Language and Literacy Education and serves as the director of our academic English program here at Vantage. Uh, Brian M Wilson is uh, our curriculum manager and faculty liaison here at Vantage. Um, and I'd like to say a big thank you to Sandra and Brian uh, for your help today. So our three speakers uh, for today are uh, Dr. Catherine Leon, who is an assistant professor of teaching in sociology who teaches in the Vantage One Arts program. Her research is situated within uh, sociology of education and the scholarship of teaching and learning. She focuses on experiential pedagogies and inclusive assessment. Catherine is founder and co-president of the Sociological Teaching Group for the International Sociological Association. She is also co-chair of the UBC Vantage One Arts Program and the teaching assistant training coordinator for the Department of Sociology here at UBC Vancouver. The topic of her presentation today will be pandemic teaching, designing UBC's new COVID-19 and society course. Our spec second speaker, is Dr. Ernest Goh, who is an assistant professor of teaching at the School of Engineering at UBC's Okanagan campus. He received his BEng and MEng degrees from Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. He taught college level engineering for more than a decade before joining a consulting group. In 2010, he returned to NTU as a research associate and at the same time embarked on his PhD studies. He then joined the National University of Singapore, where he taught mechanical design related courses. In 2016, he was jointly hired by the School of Engineering at UBC Okanagan and Vantage College. His teaching duties comprise courses for UBCO engineering students in winter terms and then two courses in the Vantage One engineering program in the summer. His topic today will be adapting to new circumstances recounting the experiences of engineering program instructors at UBCO. Dr. Anka Lecky is our third speaker, and she is an assistant professor of teaching in the Department of Chemistry who teaches in the Vantage One Science program. She mainly teaches general chemistry as well as analytical and environmental chemistry. In addition to teaching, Anka manages and facilitates the Chemistry Teaching Assistant Training Program and is the chair of the Vantage College Intercultural Communication Committee. Her research interests include investigating the effectiveness of team-based learning and the relationship between epistemologies and student experiences in first year university. Her topic today will be a discussion of key design considerations and implementation for teaching chemistry online. As you listen to your speakers today, please hold your questions until after all of our speakers have finished. 
You are welcome to type any questions that you have or that you may have during the presentations into the chat box. Our moderators will be monitoring the chat boxes during the speaker presentation and we will make sure that we have lots of time left at the end for questions. We will have each presenter deliver their presentations one after each other before we open it up for questions. So Catherine, I invite you to begin with your presentation. Thanks very much, Joanne. And thanks everyone for being here today uh, for my presentation on how and why I designed a sociology course exploring the societal impacts of COVID-19. And my subheading is structuring student learning about a pandemic during a pandemic. Okay, let me see if I can figure out how to change this slide. Yes. So, can you see the three? Yes, there they are. Okay, great. Sorry. Uh, so COVID-19 in Society is a course uh, that I just finished teaching in summer term two for the first time. Obviously, it's a new course. Um, and it's a three credit arts course that uh, was taught completely remotely in the Department of Sociology or for the department, but not in the department. There's no prerequisites. And this ended up attracting um, 180 students from across arts, science, business, and land and food systems. Uh, the course offered students sociological lenses and recent data highlighting how COVID-19 exposed and exacerbated social inequality, reshaped social interaction, and challenged foundational social institutions. So I'm gonna give you an example of how we discussed each of the, these three themes. So under social inequality, our unit on age and ageism asks things like, how has COVID-19 affected ageist discourses and ageism embedded in Canada's elder care system? It also asked, uh, how is the ability to physically distance organized by socioeconomic status? And that was related to our unit on health inequities. The unit on global inequality asked, how did the demand for face masks affect workers in the global supply chain of personal protective equipment? So taking a global lens there. Under the theme of social interaction, we asked what happens to communities when social infrastructures close? How, what does physically distance dating look like? Does what we wear matter when we're self-isolating, thinking about identity and whether people are getting dressed up to stay at home or to go on Zoom? Um, and how do social networks analysts map COVID-19 networks? Under social institutions, we considered things like work, the economy, uh, family, healthcare, the legal system. Um, so for example, under the institution on family, we asked how have lockdown conditions unfortunately perpetuated family violence and what can be done about that? How have families responded to changes in other institutions like work and school when people are working from home? How does that affect the family? And when schools close, who takes on that unpaid and invisible labor? And so how is this unpaid COVID labor in the home gendered, classed, and racialized? So I want to discuss today four different things I was trying to do when I put this course together. So I wanted to bring together the latest sociological research on COVID. I wanted to facilitate students processing of the pandemic in real time because it's very rare to be able to teach about something that's happening right now. I wanted to create a virtual learning community, even under conditions of physical distancing and remote teaching. And I wanted to offer opportunities in the design of the course for students to experience agency in relation to this crisis and also in relation to their remote learning under these crisis conditions. So let's start with number one. Um, I wanted to bring together the latest sociological COVID-19 research. And I wanted to bring this all together in one place with a coherent narrative and uh, making it really accessible for students to process. And sociology offers some unique angles on the pandemic. Um, it challenges this narrative of individualized risk and instead takes a collective and often global lens. Um, and I thought it would be useful for students to interpret COVID data at both micro and macro levels and often tying their own experiences to broader social patterns that they see happening around them. 
And I was really fortunate to have a very supportive department head, Guy Steklov, uh, who I went to about a month and a half before summer term two started. Um, and I told him about this idea that I had, um, and he was on board and together we invited everyone in the department to contribute to this course um, in some way. Oops. Uh, and UBC sociologists have been really actively researching COVID. You might have seen some of this research in the news um, on topics like gender inequality that we see here. Also research on racism, immigration and residency status and how that is affected by COVID. Uh, research on Canada's history of racism and discrimination and how that is framing COVID discourses today. Um, as well as an interpersonal focus on how the pandemic has affected relationships, friendships at a distance, family members who are now spending all their time together, workplace relationships where you don't have that face-to-face -face component. And here we see uh, a sociologist from UBC talking about roommates. So in the end, it was a massive collaborative effort and I'm so grateful for 13 faculty members and seven grad students who came forward to share their expertise. Um, I won't be able to speak to the contribution that each person made to the course, but I'd like to acknowledge them here by writing their name. I've put an asterisk next to Anna Miniassi at the end, who's um, actually a TA with Vantage in my sociology class, um, and she's studying gender under COVID for her thesis, so she was a big part in the course. So how did I facilitate this uh, collaborative course development? So we had large team meetings where we discussed the overall course, course learning outcomes and the three course themes that I mentioned. Um, and then each person contributed a mini lecture on their topic of expertise. And in these meetings, people gave mini presentations so we all understood what lecture each other would be giving and we were able to see the connections between them um, and to larger course themes. And so then my work began um, when I turned each of these mini lectures into an entire module. So for example, um, in the pandemic racism module, which is shown here, um, sociology professor Amanda Chong contributed mini lectures on anti-Asian acts and discourses under COVID-19 and connected this to North America's history of Asian exclusion. Then I, added a mini lecture to contextualize this issue at the beginning of the module. So I introduced the concepts of prejudice, discrimination, and systemic racism, and I connected it to the larger course theme of social inequality and to other modules on ageism, classism, and sexism that were also in the course. In addition to that, I added a, a reading, a discussion, a short quiz, and an optional journal prompt. And my goal here is to provide a consistent narrative. Oh, I'm just looking at the Q&A here. Um, good question. So um, I provided a consistent narrative and a general structure that was consistent across modules, even though there were different voices in the modules. And students actually commented in the feedback that the guest lectures were one of their favorite um, components of the course. So um, my second goal was to support students in processing the pandemic as it happens in real time. Um, and I did this by making course activities that were often per personalized for students with them sharing, for example, um, about COVID changes in the city where they were living in. So I'll give you an example of one of these more personal activities. So a bit similar to what we just did in the icebreaker here, our class made a custom Google map documenting changes in public spaces under COVID. So each point here represents one student in the course. And as you can see, students are learning um, from all over the world. And the link is here in case you want to visit the map. So here we can see a zoom in of um, Vancouver. So we see a variety of spots selected. Each student was free to pick a, a, a spot that mattered to them. So they could be a social or community service. It could be recreation, arts and culture, places to buy food. Um, and they were documenting how to access it under COVID, new hours, new safety measures, maybe a new patio built and so on. So if you click on 
a point, you will see the student has added an image and a description. So here we see a drive through, uh, just a pop up newly created drive through in Alberta um, that the student has mentioned all funds are donated to the local food bank. And then students were invited to share this map with their social networks through the hashtag pandemic spaces. My third motivation was to create a virtual learning community during this time of physical distancing where we can't be meeting in our classes face to face. So students are taking this course remotely. Many of them have just moved home and that might be in another country. Um, some students were entering quarantine or exiting quarantine in the middle of this course. Um, and I wanted to create spaces of interaction, not to replicate the face-to-face -face moments of chatter in class, but at least opportunities for connection. And one of the ways that I did this, as an example, was the use of peer-to-peer -peer dialogue on lectures. Um, so students, each module, were asked to comment either on one lecture or one reading using uh, UBC's class program, which is fantastic. I highly recommend it. And what's cool about class is that all the comments are time stamped. So as you're watching, they pop up and they're relevant to that particular moment in the, in the lecture. So this was pretty open-ended, but students were allowed to ask a question that they wanted advice on, respond to another student's question, or share a resource or link. So here you can see a student is actually sharing research uh, by UBC sociologists. This was particularly cool when you look at how this worked out on the readings. So students are highlighting line by line and often they're clarifying terms and arguments for each other. I should note that some students felt like this graded discussion was a bit formal and restrictive. Like they said, they couldn't really say what they truly thought because it was being monitored. Um, and so to address this formality, I implemented uh, another form of learning community in Canvas. Uh, so this class has 180 students in it. So I used the Canvas groups function to break it into smaller groups of 30 to 40 students. And I got this idea from Stephen Barnes, who uses it for his larger MOOC. Um, so each learning community has their own private space for announcements and discussions, and they have their own dedicated TA who posts a weekly update there. So this is an ungraded informal space. And when I look at it now, I see about 20% of students actually contributed, shared their thoughts, shared podcasts, and then 90% viewed this space. So there's limited engagement, but it was there for the students who wanted it. So I think I'll use this again in the fall when I teach this, but I might modify it a little bit. And then the last thing I want to talk about is uh, creating this course in a way that offered opportunities for students to experience a sense of agency in relation to the crisis itself and in relation to their own remote learning. Um, so let's start with A, which is in relation to the pandemic. So I know for myself and for many of my students, COVID made us feel out of control. Um, and one way to get a sense of control is to do things that actually influence or impact your environment. So I designed the major course assignment to be connected to real world relevance and real world utility. So the major course assignment required evidence-based knowledge translation and knowledge sharing about COVID. I teamed up with UBC's Office of Regional and International Community Engagement, and together we worked with a variety of nonprofit organizations whose clients had been affected by COVID. Um, each organization was looking to document and communicate essential information about COVID, either to the client groups that they work with or to their internal staff members. So student teams picked an organization and a topic and produced an infographic that we delivered to the nonprofit organization for their use um, and also a paper on this topic with in-depth research. So here's an example of um, an infographic on food insecurity that was produced with the Food Stash Foundation. Um, and I could discuss doing community engaged learning in a large class remotely, um, but I've decided to just bracket that whole conversation for another presentation. So we're just grading <clears throat> the infographics now. And then the last way that I built agency into uh, the course was through the structure of the course itself. I wanted to give students as much flexibility as possible in their, in their own remote learning choices. 
Um, and I did this by building a lot of freedom into the asynchronous engagement. Um, so students could pick when they wanted to work on the course. So all module components, like the quizzes and discussions, were open for a three-day window. So students did, did have a clear deadline and there was accountability and regular engagement with the course, but they could do this during the day, they could do this at night, and they could choose which day, depending on if they were working, if they had care responsibilities and so on. And it felt like the discussion, even though it wasn't happening in real second by second interaction, it was still quite dynamic and responsive. Um, and then all synchronous components of the course, like I held a live lecture the first week to build rapport, were recorded and posted and non-mandatory. I also built in flexibility on what topics students wanted to go deeper with. So I understand people are affected very differently by various COVID issues. And so each module offered students a journal option and various discussion topics. And they could choose if that was the module where they wanted to go deeper or if that was a module where they wanted to um, just engage at a surface level and then move on to the next module three days later. We also did a pre-survey vote on specific module topics and I made some of the modules optional. So I'm at my 15 minutes now. So in sum, my four motivations for creating this course and I'll be delivering it again in September. So I welcome any feedback and questions and it's also just been selected as, um, as an edX course that's gonna be free for the public starting in later September. So thank you very much. Thank you, Catherine. Um, you, I really appreciate your presentation um, and encourage the, anyone who's listening to put any uh, questions they might have in the uh, chat box and we will come back to you, Catherine, at the end of our presentations for our Q&A. Um, Ernest, I invite you to uh, begin your presentation. Thank you very much, Joanne. Uh, I shall start the screen sharing. All right, let me begin. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Ernest Goh, and I'm an assistant professor of teaching at UBC's Okanagan campus in the city of Kelowna. Um, I am also the vantage coordinator for the Okanagan campus. So let me begin. So uh, this slide gives you a bit of background. Um, Vantage College has the Applied Science stream, uh, but although there are many programs in the Faculty of Applied Science, engineering is the one that is available for Vantage students. And uh, like Joanne man mentioned, we also have the mandatory summer term, but what's different from the other streams is that uh, this summer term is held in the Okanagan campus, or it used to be held in the Okanagan campus. Um, in the summer, students take these four courses. Um, they have Event 151, Multidisciplinary Engineering Design Project, EPSI 176, Engineering Communication, EPSI 179, Linear Algebra, and EPSI 180, Statics. Uh, so as you can see, it's quite a heavy workload, and uh, especially taking into consideration that this course here, Event 151, is a project course. Um, so, like everyone else, in the summer, all these courses had to be delivered online. Um, so, let's look at what's the enrollment like. This summer, there were a total of 64 students. And prior to the start of term, two weeks before, in fact, I asked the students to tell us where they were and when they would be at those places. So, in BC, we started with 37 students in BC, and then that dropped to 32 as more of them um, went back to their home countries. In Afro-Eurasia, we have four, East Asia, 19 rising to 24, and there were other Canadians and uh, one in Mexico, forming four students. All right, so as you can see, um, roughly half in BC and half elsewhere in the world. 
So with that kind of distribution of students all over the world, um, this, as you see on the screen, is supposed to be the official timetable. Um, that timetable becomes uh, impractical because of uh, uh, times of the day. So get rid of that. So looking at where they are, is there a best time for synchronous activities? Look at this table, sort of, there is the best time, 6 a.m. to 8 a.m. in BC, um, corresponds to uh, mid-morning in the rest of Canada or North America, um, the afternoon, late afternoon um, in Asia, uh, well, Central uh, Asia, and then late night, roughly bed bedtime in East Asia. So this was the best, uh, but it's just marginally reasonable, quite unreasonable for people in BC and for people in Korea. And then uh, some of the other time slots they have listed here, like midday, uh, impossible for uh, uh, South Korea. And then evening would be impossible for those in the Afro-Eurasia region. So, um, Taking into consideration the detailed uh, locations of the other students, um, even if the BC students reluctantly agree to have classes at 6 a.m., um, the internet connection may not be reliable for everyone, uh, especially from those uh, outside of BC. Um, so the first decision arising from this was that the, all of us, the instructors of the term, decided that the courses would be mainly asynchronous, delivered by pre-recorded media. All right, so um, with this decision to go asynchronous, lectures, tutorials, and studios were all pre-recorded. Um, so typically, the media for the week is published on Sunday, um, and that will be in time for them to work on it uh, in the following days of that week. Um, for one of the courses, the EPSI 180 uh, release of the media, pre-recorded media is usually a bit earlier. Um, this, was, uh, this is because uh, that course had uh, some media developed um, the year before. So some of them were ready. Okay, but the problem with um, making things asynchronous, um, well, you know, students may not necessarily uh, do things um, like when we t tell them, they could just put it off as much as they can. Um, so the risk is that could the students do everything the day before the exam? Uh, well, of course, um, that's being uh, sort of uh, tongue-in-cheek or humorous, but uh, even if they do it a week before the exam, that's not a good uh, outcome that we want. Um, so therefore, to prevent that from happening, we set goals for um, weekly goals. So each course will have a set of large goals, a set of small goals, and to support the attainment of those goals, we provided two office hours slots, one in the evening mainly for the students in East Asia and another one in the late morning uh, for those in the rest of the world. So given this uh, kind of goal set up, um, we leave it to them to plan their own personal timetable to accomplish these weekly goals. So what I did also was to prepare a welcome video and emphasize this uh, weekly goals kind of arrangement and the need for them to plan their own timetable. So how does the typical week look like? For, from the student's point of view. So here you see a table. We have um, the five weekdays of a week, starting from Monday, and uh, that's uh, a goal-free day. But from Tuesday onward, there is a large goal for each course. And then to support those goals, the day before that goal is the office hours for that course. So you can see event 151, office hours is on Monday because 
there are the large goals uh, due on Tuesday, and so on. And additionally, the small goals are spaced at least two days away from the large goals. And typically these are more easily attained. So we foresee that they shouldn't have to um, attend office hours to complete them. So for example, quizzes um, uh, in lectures. So they should be able to answer the simple quiz questions just by looking at the, uh, watching the lectures. We set the due time for all these goals to be 9 p.m. Uh, BC time. And for the four students in the Afro-Eurasian regions, it is 2 a.m. the following day. Um, so this is to make the due times reasonable for everyone. If we actually 9 p.m. in BC corresponds to 7 or 6 a.m. in the morning for those in Afro-Eurasia, so um, that could potentially force them to work all night just to meet the due time. So we made it um, a little bit later so that it's uh, late morning or middle of the day for them. So that was a typical week and there are two uh, unusual weeks in the summer term. Week two is the week of Victoria Day. Um, so for Victoria Day, Monday is a holiday so we did not want to hold office hours uh, so office hours for Monday of week two is moved to Friday, and that is the office hours for Vantage 151. And so the small goals for that week is moved to Saturday. Um, furthermore, lo no large goals were set for that week because it's just uh, near the beginning of term. And uh, so not a lot of content had been covered, um, so which means we can cancel the large goals. Then in week eight, Canada Day is on Wednesday. Um, but that is also the final teaching week of the term. And so um, the work should be sort of a culminating major work of the whole term. So small goals were not needed. So we only had large goals for that week. Uh, similarly, the Wednesday office hours is affected by uh, the public holiday. And that corresponds to APSI 179 has moved to Friday, and so the goals for that course is moved to Saturday. So in planning this kind of arrangement, we did consider uh, alternatives. Uh, oh, uh, no, perhaps I should speak about the detailed arrangements for Vantage 151. Um, you probably saw in the, uh, the weekly, typical week, that uh, a time slot was set aside for synchronous sessions. So one of the courses, only one, Vantage 151, had two synchronous sessions in week five and eight. All the office hours in, uh, at, you saw in, in that weekly uh, schedule are optional. So what we wanted was just uh, for students to attain the goals. If they can do it on their own without attending office hours, we are all okay with that. And goals, are published in a spaced out manner. Um, we don't have them open right from the start of term. So typically it's one to two weeks before the due time. Yes, now talking about the alternatives, um, we did consider to make it uh, less onerous for them to track multiple uh, goals and deadlines. Uh, should we have just one set of large goals? Um, Again, even though that is still spacing out the workload, uh, but uh, we were still worried that they could leave everything until the night before it's due. So the small ones sort of uh, prompt them to start working on it first so that the large ones can be completed um, with the foundation of the smaller ones. The other alternative is to reward early submission um, but we thought that since we are already throwing out the timetable, um, we should have in its place a bit of structure for the students. Okay, so those were the overview of the design of the entire term, all the four courses. So from now, uh, from this point on, I'm going to talk about the course specific highlights. So starting in numerical order, we have VANT 151. In this course, there are three main foci, uh, project management, SolidWorks, which is a computer-aided design software, 
and engineering design. So this one being a project course, the students had to do a project to build a scaled down prototype of an energy recovery clothes dryer. The students are divided into teams, large teams, 10 to 13 students, which are then further subdivided into these sub teams. So we have documentation, mechanical, structural, and thermal sub teams. And these sub teams, oops, did computer based work. And the electrical and electronic sub team and the user interface sub team, they built prototypes. So for these two sub teams that uh, built prototypes, we limited uh, the number of students to just two in the sub team because we needed to uh, deliver components for them and then keeping the number of students to a certain limit, um, we kept the number of packages to send out more manageable. As for the learning of SOLIDWORKS, um, in the past, they had their lessons in the UBCO computer labs. And additionally, all the AppSci students are eligible to install the software on their personal computers. Um, but the installation on their personal computers is mainly for convenience. When they're having team discussions, they could um, use the software to design the, um, the, the prototype. Um, however, this software runs only on Windows. And then because it's uh, engineering software, the computers have to be sufficiently pow powerful. Um, in the past, if the students' uh, personal uh, computers couldn't install it for whatever reason, it doesn't critically affect their learning. But this time, um, without access to the labs, if they didn't have the software, uh, they would miss out the big chunk of this course. Um, so some of the means of access of this to this software was essential. So fortunately, there is something called remote spark service, right? This was a, still experimental when the summer term started uh, and it allows users to connect to the powerful desktops in the UBCO computer labs. Um, eight students in this term use this service and after the initial login teething problems, they could connect quite smoothly. Um, the student in Turkey, for example, uh, he relied on this service he scored reasonably well in the SOLIDWORKS exercises, and he was also the person responsible for designing the features on the chassis of his prototype. Now, as for the electrical and electronics, um, as usual, we buy the electronic components from DigiKey. They offer free next day delivery if you order more than $100. Um, and for the students in Canada, that's no problem and we had to pay a $30 delivery to international destinations. A minor issue was a customs declaration in China. Fortunately, the technician is proficient in Chinese. She could do that. And actually, after explaining that the parts were for an online course, um, they let the package in without much hassle. So on the whole, it still went quite smoothly. So here I can show you some of the work by students. Let's show, uh, let me show you a sample of work that is computer-based. Okay, I'm clicking the link. I shall pull the screen over. I hope all of you can see uh, the screen. Yep, we can see it, Ernest. I would like to let you know that your 15-minute um, time period is uh, up. I have the difficult task of keeping us on time today. Okay. Um, as you, if you, after you show this piece of work, maybe you could summarize sort of the highlights, um, right. and we'll move to our third presentation. Thank you, Ernest. Okay. So in the interest of time, I think I will have to fast forward quite a lot to, uh, I think, a summary of the experiences uh, from all the instructors. So as you have just heard, um, we, instead of designing our courses individually, 
um, we design the whole term and from the student's perspective. And to do that well, get as much information as uh, possible about the student's circumstances, like the time zone, the dates that they are traveling. We could offer uh, extension to their uh, assignments when they were traveling. So what I did was to override a default start date on Canvas and then um, do a survey. So we could get the information before the term started. And because um, it's asynchronous, emphasize to them with a welcome video like what I did, uh, the need for them to stay connected, like checking their emails. Um, asynchronous delivery should be the primary mode, minimizing synchronous activities. Among us, we had our weekly meetings. Uh, that was effective in detecting early alert cases. But even then, uh, one student started to fall behind later in the term and we missed that. And that student failed three courses. We had a midterm feedback, generally positive. Um, but uh, still, I would like to emphasize that you have to keep in touch with students to prevent them from getting lost. As I had alluded to earlier, office hours were not well attended. Oops. Was it because our big... Okay, um, office hours were not well attended. Um, for example, my course, five students attended over the whole term. Um, so perhaps uh, from this, it, is it time to rethink our workload uh, measured in terms of timetable hours? Um, the the APSI 180 uh, media, it took two co-op students spending 400 hours each to produce them. Um, so that is uh, a stark contrast to the 39 hours of lectures that I'm supposed to deliver, deliver each term. Okay, so with that, I'll give due credit to uh, Yannick Aikna and Mehran Shirazi, which are the two instructors uh, who taught with me this term. I'm sorry for exceeding the time and I'll hand it over to the next speaker. No problem. Thank you, Ernest, for your insights. Uh, Anka, I invite you to uh, begin your presentation and I'll remind everyone that an answer period after uh, our three presentations. So, Anka, we can see your slide. You're welcome to begin. Perfect. Okay. Hi, everyone. Um, all right. So, I'm going to be speaking of the key considerations that I had while I was preparing for teaching uh, a first year chemistry course um, this last summer. So, I'll talk about my considerations first and then how I implemented those considerations in an online format. Okay, so uh, give you a little bit of context. So it was a Vantage course, um, a first year chemistry course for Vantage students. Um, I had surveyed my students ahead of time and much like what's been mentioned before with uh, Joanne and Ernest, half my class was uh, not um, in Vancouver time, they had gone home. So I definitely had to think about that um, as I was preparing. So my first question um, when I was thinking about, okay, I want to, what do I want to do with this course is, you know, what are my priorities? Well, the first couple of priorities were easy to uh, identify because it's the same answer that I would give whether I was teaching an online course or a face-to-face. -face. So my first two priorities was to make sure that I incorporated peer learning or collaborative learning. And then my second priority was to make sure that I have an active learning component. And then from there, I started thinking about, okay, well, we are in an online format. So what are, what are my additional priorities um, that are particular for this, for this format? I was um, quite concerned about student isolation. Um, if you remember around May, so when the course began, we were still relatively new, um, you know, experiencing this pandemic was um, still, still sort of new. And I know not even being a student, I was feeling a little isolated. So that then came to um, my next priority, which was how do I build community? So yes, my students are all over the world. How are they gonna feel connected with each other, with me, with the TAs, how am I going to do that? And then my last priority was about just the content and how are they going to be able to access the content? 
I had gotten used to, um, when I teach my face-to-face -face classes, handing out worksheets during class, you know, and just starting to get a paradigm shift in my mind that, okay, how do I accomplish the same type of thing, but again, online. Okay, so I'm going to start. Um, so these were my priorities, and now I'm going to tell you about how I implemented those priorities um, again uh, in, this, in this course. So we'll start with the content. So maybe this, this is a snapshot of my Canvas page. Maybe this looks familiar to you. Um, you'll, uh, this was actually given, this example was forwarded um, by Brian um, Wilson. Uh, so I just copied it because I loved it so much. So it's an example from the arts, um, is it Canvas example? So I use that to help me organize the content of the canvas shell. Um, in particular, I really liked the having the Vancouver home clock there so that students were very well aware of what the deadlines were for assignments. Um, in terms of a textbook, I was very lucky that there was an online textbook for the course that was created by uh, Dr. Kaylee Johnson, who taught this course um, in previous years. So that was an easy decision. It was accessible, free. Um, so that was my only required textbook for the course. Um, I decided that I would deliver the course um, synchronously but that each, in Collaborate Ultra, but that each um, lecture, lecture was recorded and that recording was made available for students that were not able to attend. Um, again, copying um, what I, the example um, Canvas Shell, in the module section, I organized um, the modules week by week and within week, which it, we, was each lecture, so each lecture got its own page. In that page, I organized my slides, any worksheets that I was handing out, um, any pre-readings, uh, uh, instructions, as well as the links to the recordings. So all of that was organized, um, and I never had a student ask me where something was, um, so I was quite happy with that. Um, another thing that I did was, and this goes to what Ernest was talking about earlier, like, is everybody going to just then, if everything's recorded, watch right before the exam? So to encourage my students to make sure that they were on top of the lecture material, I used lecture quizzes on Canvas. So what that means is that each lecture had its, had its own quiz. And in that quiz, um, very generic information would be given. So it would just be called lecture 3.1 quiz, um, and the question would say something like question one from lecture 3.1, and then the answer options would be very generic, A, B, C, and D. So when students came to class, they would open up, like they would have their Collaborate uh, Ultra session open, and then they would open up a lecture quiz, and that's the generic information that they would see. And then during class, I would actually give them the question, and then they would answer the question both on the polling feature in Collaborate Ultra, as well as on the lecture quiz. So that way they would get marks for their answer on the quiz, and then the polling feature was really um, to get feedback on um, their understanding of the content. These lecture quizzes were due within 24 hours of the, when the lecture took place. Um, so that way, if somebody was watching a recording, they would have to watch that recording within 24 hours to complete um, this lecture quiz. Okay, my next priority was around building community. So um, students were encouraged, reminded constantly to post pictures of themselves on Collaborate Ultra. Um, so it's a fairly easy thing to do. So you just go into my settings and you can post a picture um, of yourself. Uh, and then another thing that I started to do towards the end of the course, um, as I was learning kind of the best ways to um, manage um, the, the sessions, was I started um, toggling between sharing my slides and then sharing camera. And the reason that I was doing this is because the recordings now was an extension of class. So what was happening in the recordings is in Collaborate Ultra, only whatever is in the main window would get recorded. So what that would mean is that during class, I would be explaining and I'd be using my hands and all this sort of stuff to 
illustrate a point, but in the recording, all the students would see is the slide. They would not see me explaining anything. They could only hear my voice. So um, what I started to do was then, uh, while I was sharing files, sharing my slides, I would stop and then I would share my camera. And what that would do is then that would put me, uh, my, uh, my video feed, in the Collaborate Ultra main frame, and I could then explain stuff. I would have um, models of um, chemical structures and then show them the models and from different perspectives. Um, so that in the recording, they could then see me actually explain something. That was actually, uh, you know, I got a lot of unsolicited positive feedback about that when I started to do that. Um, I even got an email from a student who was watching the recording saying, hey, it was really nice seeing you, <laughs> um, you know, because they hadn't been used to seeing me um, before that. And then another thing to just build community was uh, there was a TA who was answering the chat feed and so students were encouraged to ask questions um, during uh, the session. Um, something else that I did was I scheduled an appointment, um, a 15 minute appointment with all the students in groups of four um, in a Collaborate Ultra session. So I did this at the beginning of the course. Um, it was a very informal kind of meeting, but it was really helpful, not just, I don't, I mean, for the students, but also for me to feel like I was connecting with my students. Um, my plan was to do this again, but I, I just didn't have the time. Um, to, to do it, but it was a good experience. I also had the experience like um, Ernest had, which is that the first time that I had my office hours, the first few times that I had my office hours, no one came. So to encourage my students to come, I said, oh, half my office hours will be a review session, and then the other half will be open for questions. And that encouraged people to come. So they came for my review session and they stayed and asked questions. So I went from having zero people to 15 people. Um, I also uh, used the discussion board and actually it was my first time using it so strategically or purposefully. Um, so I would post review questions. Students would be told that they would have to answer one of the review questions um, for marks, and then they had to respond to each other. So in that way, I also tried to get them to connect with each other a little bit. Um, I would start off class with uh, sort of icebreaker questions like, you know, uh, how many of you uh, got eight hours of sleep last night or something something silly like that and then students were would have to respond with an emoji choosing an emoji from um, uh, the collaborate ultra uh, rather than actually typing in an answer okay my next priority was around active learning and so um, you know there was a synchronous and asynchronous component the synchronous I've spoken about so the active learning really was around the polling feature in collaborate ultra and then as well I did have worksheets where students had to draw structures um, so something that they wouldn't be able to quickly answer on a multi like in a multiple choice format so um, I also had worksheets um, the asynchronous component was students were given um, assigned readings and then they were given a quiz um, with that and then they were also given weekly homework. Uh, I was very mindful to make sure that there was routine to what they were doing so they knew what to expect. So every Wednesday at 10 o'clock uh, Vancouver time, homework was due, every Thursday there was a tutorial, um, every second week there was uh, uh, review questions that had to be um, answered on a discussion board, so I tried to build routine as much as possible. Uh, and then my next um, priority in designing was um, having a peer learning component or collaborate, uh, collaborative learning, and um, I did this during the lectures, um, I did use the breakout feature. I learned a lot um, when I used this feature. Uh, the first thing that I learned was that, um, so the first thing that I tried, I should say, is having randomized groups. Now, my students did know each other before this course started. So I got some feedback saying, you know, I am being put into a group with someone that I'm not really friends with and they are, um, just talking to their own friends about the question on like a different platform, like WeChat. 
Um, so can we just have our own groups, like choose our own groups? And I thought, hey, why not? <laughs> so during lecture, you tend to um, form a group with people that you're sitting with or your friends. So then what I started doing was I would just create the groups um, and I would do that by clicking on custom assignment and then just clicking allow attendees to switch groups. And that way students could just move themselves um, between the groups and between each group and the main room. So a student would just move themselves into, let's say, group one or whatever. There was an added bonus to doing um, it this way. And the added bonus was that when I, we ended the breakout groups, we would just ask people to move themselves back into the main room. And that solved a lot of the connectivity issues around Collaborate Ultra. So one of the big things in Collaborate Ultra, one of the big drawbacks or challenges has been that when you end the breakout groups, people lose their connection. So we found that by doing it this way, that was minimized. Uh, another thing that I'll just mention that one, one thing that definitely changed was, um, you know, in a face-to-face -face setting, I would tend to have like lots of opportunity for groups, group work um, where people would discuss one question, but I found um, in the online world that it was just, it would take up so much time, the initial setup and, the, and then the uh, breakdown of the groups that I then started to just have a longer um, breakout group session where students worked on multiple questions rather than little ones throughout. Um, a, just note about the tutorials. So the tutorials were mandatory because there were multiple sections at different times. times. Um, so because of that, I felt like students could choose a section that was um, favorable to their own time zone. So um, the tutorials were not recorded. They were run by TAs. Um, and basically in a tutorial, students would, ahead of the tutorial, individually complete a homework assignment online. They would come to the tutorial and then they would be put into teams. These teams would be the same throughout the course. And then they would be um, given a worksheet to complete in teams. They would complete that worksheet and then they would, um, like the idea that I had was that they would hand in the worksheet and then when they handed in the worksheet, I would give them a new worksheet. And now this time they can complete it for bonus marks. And then when they're done that worksheet, they can hand that in. And now I give them a new worksheet, which again can be done for bonus marks. So th even this piece, like, okay, in a physical, in face-to-face, -face, I can, you know, it's very easy to think of, okay, somebody hands something in, I hand something to them. Um, but how do I do this in online? Because I don't want to just post something because I don't want it to be accessible until they've handed in the first worksheet or the worksheet prior. So um, I was able to figure this out. Um, so I had Canvas pages that were hidden and we would just send out the links to the Canvas pages and those links then would house um, the new worksheet. So students would only be given the links until they submitted the previous worksheet. Okay, and then just uh, a bit of feedback from students about all of this. Um, so feedback was actually quite positive. I did do a survey in the middle of the term and then I looked at uh, the evaluations at the end of term. Um, the, it was all very positive. Um, students commented that they thought that the course was designed well. Um, more than ever, I actually had students comment that um, they, the workload was very manageable and they really appreciated the weekly homework structure. So just having that routine and then also um, having the recordings. So the recordings were super popular. I was told constantly that, you know, I, I'm in the lecture, but then I also watch the recordings and I fast forward to parts that I think that I missed out on. Um, I'll say that I did get more emails from students in this course than in previous courses. Um, one student told me that they felt more comfortable emailing me because they met me at the beginning of the course. Um, students still at the end, so in my evaluation, still had mixed um, reviews around the breakout groups um, during lecture. So not the ones in the tutorials, but in the lecture um, using the breakout groups. Um, 
everything around, you know, the grades and, and my evaluation scores were very consistent with previous years. Um, but the biggest complaint was around connectivity. Okay, I think that brings me to an end. So thank you. There's my email address if you want to ask me questions later. And I'll just put up the slide now. Thank you, Anka, and thank you to all our presenters uh, for your insightful comments. I've learned a lot of tips, and I really appreciate all three of your presentations.